Okay, and why did we need that normal force? Because now we could figure out how much static friction right. there is and therefore how much power force we need to overcome the static friction. Right. Yeah, good. Let me show you what I think is the best way to do that. So what X forces do we have to list here? What are the X forces? Well, does this have an X force? Yes. yes. Does this have an X force? No. Does this have an X force? Yes. yes. Positive. 25.4. Does this have an X force? No. Um, so, and then on the right hand side, what should I plug in on the right hand side? We've got the mass to be 5. And what else? If the acceleration in the X direction, we would have it to not, we don't know it yet. Now remember that we made an assumption. We're assuming that we're not sliding. This is why we have to make this assumption. Unless we make some assumption, we, we, we can't solve the equations. We've got to make some assumption. So we decided to assume there was no sliding because that would give us an inequality. So with this assumption, this is going to be zero, so we can't forget about that. So our static friction here is going to be 25.4. And now we can check this against our inequality to see whether we violated that or not. That doesn't work. Yeah, we can move this term over here. And that would be, those would come out. Did I make a mistake? No, but I mean, if you plug it into the thing, 0.45 times 108.8 oh. is 25.4. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, yeah. sorry. So um, we know that f of s is got, supposed to be less than mu s times n. So f of s is supposed to be less than 0.4 times 108.8. 0.45, I think. Thank you. Yeah, we should be using static friction because our assumption is that we're not moving. All right, so that's 48.9, or about 49. <coughs> okay. So what did we figure out here? Um, is the object going to move or not? No. No, because this number is compatible with this number down here. So um, the question was asking us, what's the acceleration of the box going to be? Well, what is the acceleration of the box going to be? Zero. Zero. So now we can stop. All right, now you can see why, when the question is asking you whether something's going to happen or not, you want to make the assumption that will give you an inequality, because that gives you something to check at the end. Um, that um, we used Newton's second's law here to get a value, and then we were able to check that against our inequality to see whether it made sense or not. So, um, if you want to know whether something is going to slide, you don't assume that it's going to slide. You assume that it won't slide, and see if that makes sense. This is, I think, already a kind of tricky kind of uh, problem. So it's good that we uh, had some time to talk about this. Now, what would have happened if um, this uh, maximum static friction had come out to be, say, 12? And it would be accelerating because we'd be pushing more than the kinetic friction. So now we would. And then how would you figure out the acceleration? Do it again. We would do the whole problem all over again. That's right. Except now, under the assumption that it is sliding, yeah. what would change then? The one thing that would change is this would now be kinetic friction, uh -huh. which we would figure out from this formula. Right. So static friction, you might have to do twice. First, assuming no sliding, and if that doesn't make sense, go through it again. So notice that if this number, if this, uh, if this had come out to be uh, bigger than our maximum friction, that doesn't mean that we screwed up. It just means that we ruled out this possibility, and then we can try the other one. Also, let me point out something here. Notice that I didn't plug in mu s times n into this formula. Sometimes some instructors in TAs would plug mu s times n into this formula. Uh, but I don't like to do that because, again, remember, this is not a formula for calculating the static friction. I think it's better just to leave this as the static friction and then just compare it to this inequality over here. Uh, th th you, there are other ways to solve this, but I think this is best because it, uh, otherwise people start to think that this formula calculates the static friction. Mm -hmm. So good. This, a good technique here is just leave this as the static friction and then simply compare what we get to this over here. If you look at the handouts, um, uh, in the part of the handout where I talk about static friction, I kind of summarize these methods for working with static friction. And then there's also a whole page in the handout that talks about how to do these condition problems, what to do when they're asking you what's going to happen. Again, make the assumption that gives you an inequality. 
uh, and then see work that out and see whether you violated that inequality. So if you, if sigma s n was smaller, then we would have to start the whole equation, do the whole problem again. That's assuming right, assuming kinetic friction, kinetic friction, and then we could use this formula to find the kinetic friction, and we would no longer be able to plug in a zero for this acceleration. We would be figuring out this acceleration. All right, a camper hangs a 28 kilogram pack between two trees. So here's a tree, and here's a tree. Using two separate pieces of rope of different lengths. What is the tension in the left rope? What is the tension in the right rope? All right, well, let's try to use the systematic approach that we've been talking about here. So how would we get started? First things first, create, create a separate, create a free body, free body diagram. diagram. How many free body diagrams would that give us? Only one. That's right. And what are the forces on this object? Gravity. Gravity is the first thing we should. What direction is that pointing? Downwards. Good. So weight, yes. What other forces? Um, tension from the right and the left. On the right and the left. Oh, and there are two different tensions. Correct. This is two different groups. Can we assume the two tensions are equal? No. no. So remember that you need to use the same symbol for things that are the same, but different symbols for things that are different. So I'll call this what? TL for the right and the left tension, and TR for the right tension. If we use T for both of those, then we're in trouble. Then get confused. Uh, all right. And what direction are these pointing in? Uh, towards the pack or away from the pack? Away. away. Because ropes can only pull, they can't push. And we know the pack is not moving. That's right. Um, how do we know that? Well, just kind of from our common sense, we're just assuming here that it says reach an equilibrium. Uh, they didn't quite tell us that, but we're expected to assume here we're in equilibrium where this isn't moving anymore. Uh, okay. Um, is there any other forces here? No, because there's nothing else touching this object besides the two pieces of rope. Just look for the weight and the things that are touching the object. Well, what's our next task? We will choose axes and positive directions. What should our axes be? X and Y. <laughs> yep. Well, horizontal and vertical, probably. Yeah. You might choose up and to the right as those. Okay, what then? Now we will break each force into components, and we have two things to break down. So we have the left hand force. I'll do that in a separate picture. Uh, and again, you could draw the triangle below the line or above the line. Uh, but it's probably better to draw it above here, because this is where the angle is. And what are the directions of these components? because the overall vector is up and to the left. And we should immediately just put in the signs. The x component is negative, and the y component is positive. As soon as you figure out the directions, put in the signs, because that's the whole point of figuring out the directions. Okay. So what should I write down here for TLX? Negative uh, cosine, cosine 71. 71. Or TL. Or TL. Now this can, um, worries a lot of students because they, they don't like to do this because they don't know what TL is. But I think we maybe talked about this last time. Even though we can't get a precise number for the X component, we're still ahead of the game for having an expression for the X component. So um, obviously if we knew TL, we would plug that in here. But even if we can't plug in TL, this is still a very useful expression for us to have. Uh, and by the same token over here, this would be TL times sine of 71, because this is opposite to the 71. All right, and then for the other one, we've got TR. Oh. Here's the angle we were given. So again, I'll write the triangle above the vector. T L T R Y that based on the sine and the cosine. That would be sine. Yes. And that's positive. Don't forget the signs. All right, so 
this is opposite to the 28, so uh, we use the sine, and then trx is in the positive direction, and that would be tr times the cosine of 28. Do we have to break the weight into components? No. Yeah, no. Okay, so no.